You are listening to the online streaming service from Emmanuel Church, Hansworth, Birmingham, UK. Good morning and welcome to this Lord's Day service, which is being streamed from Emmanuel Church in Hansworth, Birmingham. We warmly welcome all of you who are joining with us this morning, those joining us for the first time, those joining us from different churches, from different parts of the UK and from abroad, we warmly welcome you and our prayer is that you'll be blessed and encouraged by the service this morning. In Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 it reads, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God knows the plans that he has for us. He knows all the things and if, even if we are and if we are in Christ, we can have peace and assurance that his plan for us is not for destruction but for our good. Short term we may suffer and go through many hardships, but God promises us eternity with him. If we are in Christ, where one day we can have a hope that there will be no more pain and no more suffering. Christ has opened the door to heaven for us through his death and the resurrection. Amen. We will now have our first hymn. Please do sing along as you would do in church. The words will come up on your screen.
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you, Lord, this morning, Lord, and we give you praise, Lord, for there is truly none like you, Lord. Lord, you are a God of compassion, Lord. You are a God who forgives us, even though, Lord, we fall short, Lord, and we are sinners, Lord. And we make mistakes every day, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this, Lord. Lord, we give you praise, Lord, for you know all things, Lord. Lord, as your word says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Lord, you know what's in our hearts, Lord, and you know, Lord, all of our worries, Lord, and all the problems that we face, Lord. And Lord, we praise you, Lord, for it's only through you, Lord, that we find rest in our hearts, Lord. Lord, you are mighty and you are powerful, powerful, Lord, and Lord, only you can carry all of our, all of our worries, Lord. And Lord, we praise you for this, Lord, Lord, for you are our refuge and our strength. As your word says, Lord, a very present help in trouble. You are our rock and our comfort. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you sacrificed your one and only son for us, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that through the cross, Lord, that we are set free, Lord, from the bondage of sin. And we thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus, Lord, who endures so much pain and suffering on our behalf, Lord. When we deserve to be punished, Lord, Lord, we thank you for this great sacrifice, Lord. Lord, we continue, Lord, to pray for our country, Lord, and for the government, Lord, during this time, Lord, of lockdown. Lord, we pray, Lord, that the virus, Lord, will continue to reduce, Lord, and Lord, that there will be few deaths, Lord. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that during this time, Lord, of lockdown, Lord, we pray, Lord, for people to come to know you during this time, Lord, for hearts to be changed, Lord, and souls to be saved, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you will continue, Lord, to give us opportunities, Lord. Lord, during this time, Lord, to share your word with others, Lord, who don't know you, Lord. Lord, through the blessings that you've given us, Lord, through these technology and resources, Lord, I pray, Lord, we may be able to use this, Lord, to share with other people about your word, Lord. And Lord, we continue, Lord, to pray for our key workers, Lord, and the NHS workers, Lord, who are working, Lord, on the front line, Lord. Lord, we commit them to you, Lord, and Lord, we pray, Lord, for their protection, Lord, and we pray, Lord, for your hand to be upon them, Lord, and to be upon their families, Lord. And we continue to pray for those who are unwell with the coronavirus, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, for... Aaron, Lord, who has been in pain, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would ease his pain, Lord, and Lord, and help him to feel better, Lord. And Lord, we pray, Lord, for David and Carnell, Lord. We pray you be with them, Lord, and Lord, we thank you, Lord, that they are getting better, Lord, and they are slowly making a good recovery, Lord. And Lord, we commit to you, Lord, Charles Shake, Revelation, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that she's also improving, Lord. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that you continue, Lord, to be with her, Lord. Lord, we pray for our dear uncle Mahinda's family, Lord. We pray you will be with them, Lord, and to continue to help them, Lord. Comfort them, Lord, and give them strength, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you may strengthen their hearts, Lord, during this difficult time, Lord, which the older family are facing, Lord. Lord, we ask for your hand to be upon our Uncle Tirith's cousin's family, Lord, Lord, as they have lost a family member due to coronavirus, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you may be with the family, Lord, and draw near to them, Lord, as they mourn. Lord, we pray, Lord, for Kevin Paul, Lord, who, whose cousin has died, Lord, at such a young age. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you be with the family, Lord, and especially, Lord, for the children, Lord, we commit them to you, Lord. Lord, who have lost their mother. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you may really, really just reach into their hearts, Lord. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that they may feel your closeness and your nearness to them, Lord. 
during this time, Lord. Lord, we commit these things in your name. Amen. We will now have our notices. We have an online prayer meeting on Tuesday for the Punjabi speakers, which is at 7 p.m. And on Wednesday for the English speakers, which is also at 7 p.m. on the Zoom app. We, there will be an online Sunday school lesson at 3 p.m. today on the Zoom app for all the children. And we may be having a Sunday school on Friday at 6 p.m. on the 22nd of May. And then we, will, we are hoping to start our Sunday evening service at 6 p.m. on Zoom. And that will, we're hoping for that to be on the 24th of May. But we will give more details of this on social media and through the announcements. We will now have our reading, which is taken from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. That's the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Now it came to pass, in the days when the judges ruled, that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion. Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the woman of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Marlon and Kilian also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Amen. We will now have our next hymn, after which will be the preaching of God's word from the pastor.
The book of Ruth in the Old Testament is a fascinating book. It's a book of love, devotion, and redemption. It talks about common people in a common setting who are guided by the hand of God. It's a beautifully crafted book, beautiful piece of literature that begins with tragedy, with death, and it finishes with joy, with the marriage and the birth of an important child. So on a Sunday morning, we'll be looking at this wonderful book. There are many themes in this book, which we'll touch on as we work through it. But the theme I want to draw your attention to, in particular, that runs throughout the entirety of the book, is the theme of God's providence. God's providence. Which basically means that God is actually involved in the affairs of men of this world. Often behind the scenes, he controls all things, all events, and he brings his purposes to pass. And I think the book is particularly relevant for today because of the state of the world. The pandemic is taking people's lives. It's causing devastation. For some people, there's financial problems uh, and other concerns. People are losing their jobs and loved ones. And then they hear Christians say something like this. God is in control. God is in control. God is sovereign. God has his purposes. To which people reply and say, is God really in control? Now, I can present a theological argument or a doctrinal argument to show you biblically how God is in control. But I think the best way to show you this is by seeing it actually played out and demonstrated before your very eyes and show you that nothing happens by chance or by luck or by fate. No, it's God. God is in control of all events. And he uses all events to bring about his purposes. And we see this very thing in the book of Ruth. When my wife and I were younger, uh, we were more energetic. We would exploit different things. And for our fifth wedding anniversary, we went to the highest mountain in Scotland, Ben Nevis. I suppose if you want to, you can get to the top of Ben Nevis um, on a helicopter, take a helicopter ride. It takes no effort. You sit in the helicopter, you enjoy the view, and you get to your destination without any effort. The Christian life is not like taking a helicopter ride. No, what we did is we walked to the top of the mountain. It took us six hours to get to the top and four hours to get back down. We were totally unprepared. We just went to view the mountain. And then I said to her, well, we're here now. Let's just go a quarter of the way. And then we, when we got to the quarter of the distance of the mountain, we, I said, let's, let's go halfway. And eventually, we ended up climbing the mountain to its summit. We didn't have proper climbing boots or any proper equipment. It was tough. There were slopes. Uh, there were um, difficult inclines. Other times, the, the path was smooth and clear. Other times, there were rocks. When we started off, it was a sunny day at the bottom. At the top, there was snow. Gita struggled, so I had to hold her hand. I had to hold her bag. So I had my bag, her bag, and her hand helping her climb up the mountain. There were twists. There were turns. Sometimes we would slip because we didn't have proper shoes. It was tiring because we hadn't trained for it. But once we're on top of the mountain, it was exhilarating just to look down on God's beautiful creation. 
This is what the Christian life is like. Sometimes the path is smooth, but other times it's rough. Sometimes there are setbacks and disappointments. You take one step forward and then you feel as if you're taking another step back. Sometimes we slip. Sometimes we fall. It's tiring at times. Other times you can relax and enjoy the journey. But you carry on because you have the end in view. And when you get there to the summit in heaven to glory, it will be wonderful, absolutely wonderful. This is what you find in the book of Ruth. There's tragedy, there are setbacks, there are twists, there are turns. At times you can enjoy the view. Other times there's suspense and you don't know what's going to happen. But in it all, God, we see, is the God of providence. He's there at every single twist and turn. He's there with his people. And through their joys and through their sorrows and through their messy lives and situations, He will bring his purposes to pass. He will get them to the top, despite the sadness and the confusion. So this is the wonderful book of Ruth, which hopefully, God willing, we'll be exploring. This morning, what I want to do is firstly start at the end, start with the conclusion, and because I want to show you God's purpose in the book of Ruth and for Ruth. And you'll, this will give us hope. So, so it ends with hope. Secondly, we'll then go back to the beginning and start work on, working our way through the book of Ruth. And we'll start with chapter 1 and we'll work through the first five verses. And you'll see here there is tragedy. So you can see there's future hope but it begins with tragedy. So we can say there's hope in tragedy. So firstly, hope. What was God's purpose for Ruth? What is the big picture here? What's going on? What's God's plan? Well, God's purpose is to take this girl, Ruth, who's from the land of Moab, She's from a people that were condemned by God, who were wicked, and they worshipped idols. So God takes this pagan girl, a worshipper of a pagan god, and he will bring her away from her people. He'll bring her out of paganism And he wonderfully redeems her. He saves her. So that she becomes a follower of the true and the living God of Israel. Not only that. Chapter 5 and verse 17 tells us that she marries a man called Boaz and they have a son. And his name is Obed. Obed has a father whose name is Jesse. And Jesse has a son whose name is David. And we know in the Bible, David becomes King David, the king of Israel. So this woman, Ruth the pagan, is saved from paganism. And she also becomes the great grandmother of a king, of royalty. Now, as if that is not enough, this goes further. Because if you turn to the New Testament and you go to the book of Matthew, in chapter 1 and verse 1 through to 17, you have the genealogy of Jesus, starting with Abraham. 
So you have the family line of Jesus. Now, who is in that family line? Verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5 is fascinating. It says this, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. And verse 6, and Jesse begot David the king. And then obviously Solomon comes in line as well. Isn't this amazing? You have two women in verse 5. Rahab. Rahab. Another woman outside the community of God's people, Israel. She was a prostitute. And you ask yourself, what is she doing here in the family line of Jesus? In the genealogy of Jesus? It's because God rescued her, saved her to demonstrate his grace that reaches out to such people. And then, of course, you have Ruth. Isn't that amazing? Ruth, a pagan Moabitess, comes into the family line of King David. But not only King David, she comes into the family line of the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you see what God's plan is? What God's purpose is for Ruth? She would become an ancestor of Jesus. God is demonstrating here, brother, sister, friend, that he saves prostitutes, people like Rahab, people who are so lost. God is demonstrating that his love is not just for the Jews, but also for pagans like Ruth, like you and like me. For Hindus that worship idols, for Sikhs who rely on their good works, for Muslims who follow a false prophet, for Buddhists, for black people, for Rastafarians who follow a false messiah, for white people, for Chinese people, for immoral people like Rahab, for atheists who say there's no God, yet they know there is a God. My siblings, uh, we have uh, a WhatsApp group, my brothers and sisters. And on one occasion, my sister um, sent a text out, and she put something about God. Then my eldest brother, who's not a Christian, said this, something like this. God does not exist. And then he went on to say something, and at the end he said, thank God. I wrote, you've just proven the fact that God does exist, because you've thanked God that God does not exist. It's for such people that Christ came. For people like Ruth, who was lost, God brought her into a relationship with himself. He brought her into the genealogy of King David and into the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a privilege. What an honor. And he can do the same for you. He can also bring you into the family of the Lord Jesus Christ if you turn to him and believe him. So I've told you the conclusion of the book of Ruth. I've shown you God's purpose so you could see the end from the beginning. So you could see where God is going with this. You can see his journey. And what you'll see is that absolutely nothing can thwart God's plans. There are setbacks, there are disappointments, there are difficulties, there are twists, there are turns. 
And what you'll see is that nothing, absolutely nothing, will change God's plans. He will do what he ordains. He is the God of providence, who is really, really involved in the affairs of people's lives and deals with them and makes provision for them so that his plans are fulfilled. And when we see Ruth and Naomi in trouble, going through difficulties, bereavement, poverty, we can look at this now because we know the conclusion and we can smile. And we can think to ourselves, Ruth, don't worry. Naomi, don't worry. It's okay. All will be well. Because God has a great plan for you. You are going to be the mother of a son, an ancestor of David and the Messiah. We say that, don't we? Because we know the end. But we need to apply that to our lives now as well. And we need to realize that, look, we're going to have setbacks, tragedies. But God is fulfilling his purposes. Even if we can't see and we don't understand, we can still trust God to know what he is doing in my life and also what he's doing in the world today. So that's the first thing. We've seen the end from the beginning. We've seen the conclusion. We've seen God's purpose and where he's going with this. So let's go back to the beginning. The end is happy, but the beginning is tragic. So secondly, let's consider the tragic beginnings. Firstly, let's consider the tragic times in which the book of Ruth existed or this thing is played out. In Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1, it says this, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Now let's just hold it there. In the, in the days when the judges ruled. Now what do we know about the days of the judges? Well, you'll notice that just before the book of Ruth is the book of the judges. So... What happened was God rescued Israel through Moses. Moses took God's people into the, led them to the promised land. Joshua then led them into the promised land to conquer it. And then after Joshua, there was the period of the judges. And this was a very, very dark and confu confusing period in the life of Israel. God's people consistently disobeyed God. They turned to idols. And God would then chasten them, punish them. And then they would cry out to God uh, for deliverance. And God would raise a judge, a leader, who would then deliver them and bring them out of their, their state. And then there would be peace in the land for a while. But then the thing, same thing would happen again and again and again. And what you find is that the period of the judges is marked with lawlessness, idolatry, false religion, theft, drunkenness, homosexuality, sexual perversion, violence, national division, civil war at times. And it's all summarized by the very last verse in the book of Judges, just before the book of Ruth starts. This is what it says. Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That sums up the, book, the period of the judges. People were doing what was right in their own eyes. Not what was right in God's eyes, but in their own eyes. Just like today. The day and age we live in. People are doing what is right in their own eyes. And so Israel, they were told, 
that if they turned away from God and did what was right in their own eyes, because they were the covenant people of God and God had given them this land, the way they behaved would affect the land as well. So God said that if you disobeyed, there would be a famine in the land and God would withhold the rain. And we read of that in the book of Deuteronomy. So these were dark days. They had disobeyed God and therefore there was this famine. And it's into this dark situation that we have the story of one family. And this whole book is devoted to this. And it shows that even in dark times, there is hope. If you've been to a jewellery shop, you will notice that they set their diamonds on display against a black background. And then they shine a light on the diamond. And the diamond looks absolutely stunning and, it's, and, and so people are persuaded to buy it. But when you get home, it's just not the same. It's because they were contrasting it against the dark background. The book of Ruth is like a diamond against a dark background, a dark period in the life of Israel, the, the dark background of the book of Judges, where everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And it's in this context that God rescues this pagan girl, he redeems her, and he demonstrates his love and his grace and makes her into an ancestor of Christ. There is a famine all over the world at the moment. Not a famine of food or water, but because of the coronavirus, we are starved of people's company. We cannot mix or socialize. Why? Is it because of God's judgment? Is it because everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes? Is God almost saying, look, go and stay in your houses. Stop talking to each other. Now talk to me, turn to me, trust me. Stop your lawlessness, stop your idolatry, stop your worship of wealth and false religion and turn to me. And who knows, God's purposes in all of this, maybe there will be some diamonds in these tragic times. Stories like that of Ruth, of people in darkness turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe this will be your story as you turn to him. God is in control. He will fulfill his purposes even in tragic times. Secondly, tragic choices. Tragic choices. Now, during the famine, um, the book focuses, zooms on a certain man in Bethlehem, in Judah. Verse 2 tells us that his name is Elimelech, his wife's name is Naomi. They have two sons, Malon and Kilion. We are told in verse 1 that this man left Bethlehem. Now, the word Bethlehem means house of bread. But in the house of bread in Bethlehem, there was no bread because the people were far from God. There was a famine in the land. Judah means praise. There was no bread in the house of bread because there was no praise in Judah, the praise of God. Instead, there was the, pay, the, the, the praise of probably of pagan gods. These places did not live up to their names. Elimelech, the name means, my God is king. 
But Elimelech, like Bethlehem and Judah, it seems, did not live up to his name. He did not trust God as king to provide for him in Bethlehem and sustain him. Some scholars think that Elimelech was doing the right thing um, by going to Moab because um, he was just looking after his family and as a father and a husband, he was make, pr making provision for them. But I think there seems to be more here. There seems to be a lack of trust in God's promise to provide for his people. He chose to be far from God's people, far from the worship of God. Uh, he couldn't bring his sacrifices to God as they did in the Old Testament. Um, and he totally isolated himself from the things of God. And moving to Moab would have exposed him to all the evils of Moab. And we see maybe something of this, an example of this, that he turned away from God because in verse 4 we know that um, his two sons, they end up marrying um, women from Moab, which was totally forbidden for the people of God. So it seems here that Elimelech um, had drifted away from God. Life is not neat and tidy. There will be famines, times of testing of one type or another. What will we do? What decisions will we make? Will we run away from God? Because you say, look, God has not been good to me. Will you run instead to Moab, into the world? Testing will come. We have choices that we need to make. There's an expression in English. We say something like this, that is the acid test. This term originated during the time when gold was wild, uh, widely circulated. And to test to see whether the gold was genuine or not, it was put into nitric acid. And if it was fake, then it would just decompose. If it was genuine, nothing would happen. God tests us. God often puts us in the acid. God sends famines. God sends hardships. And if we are genuine believers, we'll not run from him, we'll turn to him. But if we are fake, we'll turn to Moab, the world. People blame God. People run away from him. People run away from the place of worship, church. They drift, they go away. Because... The famine, the testing, is really revealing where their heart is. Did they really trust God in the first place? Or maybe you are a believer and you backslide. Whether we like it or not, God will test us to see where our faith really is. He will press us. He will squeeze us like we squeeze an orange and get orange juice out of it. God will squeeze us to see what comes out of us, out of our mouths and the way we behave and what we do and the way we react. Will we still love him or will we turn away from him? Will we really say God is in control? Do we really follow him? Only, only, is it only when things are good? But is it when things are bad as well? Will we stay in the house of bread in Bethlehem? Will we stay close to Christ, the bread of life, who supplies our spiritual needs? Or will we go to Moab? So firstly, we've seen tragedy. Tragedy here 
in the times in which Ruth lived, everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. Secondly, we see the tragic choices that Elimelech made. He left the house of bread. He went to Moab. And finally, the tragic consequences, the tragic consequences. In verse 3, we are told that Elimelech died. His wife, Naomi, is left. She's alone. She's a widow. She has two sons. They take pagan wives, Orpah and Ruth, and they live for 10 years. Naomi must have thought to herself, my husband is dead. My children will now provide for me because in those days, widows were provided for by their families. But the two sons, Malon, which means sick, that's what the name means. Kilion means wasting away. They did live up to their names because they sadly died. And we read that in verse 5, that she is left alone. Her husband is dead, her two sons are dead. She's left with her two daughters-in-law. She's poor now, she's destitute. There's no one to provide for her. Maybe this was God's chastening for their disobedience, for their backsliding. Whether that is the case or not, we can certainly say this, this was tragic. And it was sad. Look, all we hear today, these days, is in our famine, all we hear of is death. We hear every day, 600 people have died, 700 people have died, 800 people have died, 400 people have died because of the coronavirus. Every type of person is dying in the community from every religious background. The church where Gita and I got married in Wolverhampton, we used the building of that church. I heard the pastor of that church died. I've heard of godly people who have died. We've lost people here. People are dying. And it may not have anything to do with chastening. It's just because of the fact that we live in a fallen world. And Christians get caught up in all of this. We're not immune from this. Gita's friend at work, her husband died from the virus. He was strong and fit. The same day, her aunt died. And then her sister-in-law died. Three members of one family. I heard of a family in America where four members of that family died. This is a fallen world that we live in. Death is all around us at the moment. Job was a godly man. And he lost all his children, all ten of his children. And what did he say? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Look, can you see here? in these opening five verses that there is tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. Everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. Tragedy. There's a famine. Tragedy. There's the leaving of Bethlehem, a wrong choice. Tragedy. There's the death of her husband. Tragedy. They married the two sons, married pagan women. Tragedy. There's the death of the two sons. Tragedy. Everywhere you hear, you see here, tragedy. But wait. Out of this tragedy, out of this mess, out of this terrible situation, God is going to do something incredible. 
He is going to bless Ruth through the twists and the turns and the setbacks and the confusion. He's going to bring her into the family line of Christ. Why? Because God is a God of providence. A God who is in control of all things. He's above all things. Above all the messy lives and the messy situations. He will bring his purposes to pass. And this is true of you today. If you are a Christian, a believer, God is in control of your life. He has a plan for your life and his plans cannot be thwarted. And even if we die, God's plans are not thwarted. His plans are still good because he can use that death for his greater plan and his good. And I stand here today in front of you as someone who has experienced the hand of God's providence. Because 38 years ago, I lost my brother who was 22 years old, who was a Christian and we all opposed him as a family. But it's only after his death that many, many people in our family started coming to the Lord and they came to know Christ. God has a purpose. God has a plan. God is the God of providence. In the day and age we live in, it's good to hear good news. And there's a beautiful story of a Christian man who visited Nicaragua in 2015. He saw the state of the country and wanted to help. So he filled a container with medical supplies for hospitals. Uh, he put his heart and soul into raising the money. And then the, when the container was full, it was shipped out to Nicaragua. The, the container landed there in April 2019, <clears throat> but they could not get the container because of customs, and um, it just got lost in the system. It couldn't be released, and they didn't have proper papers to release it. So some missionaries tried to track it down. There was confusion, there were delays, difficulties. Eventually, the container was found and it was open and nothing was missing everything was there all the medical equipment there were face masks ICU beds nebulizers oxygen tanks monitors respirators 50,000 masks 44,000 gloves and other equipment God knew in 2015 of what would happen in 2020. And this container was delayed. There was frustration and complications and difficulties and hiccups so that the container could be held back and get there on March the 26th of 2020, when the virus, the coronavirus, was there in the country of Nicar Nicaragua. And 19 hospitals were supplied with the, the medical equipment that was in there. God uses all things to fulfill his plans. God is a God of providence. God is in control. God is a good God. He will bring his purposes to pass. Even through our mistakes, even through our chastening, even through our sufferings, even through tragic situations, even through loss 
that we may be facing today, God is a God of providence. Turn to him. Trust him. Come to Christ. This is God's desire for you, that you know him and know this great and mighty God, the God of providence. Amen. We will now have our last hymn, and it'll come up on the screen. And as we've been saying, please do sing along at home as you sing in church. Okay, let's now close the meeting in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful book of Ruth, where we see your providence at work in a tangible way, that you are the God who is there at, there at every twist and turn. Lord, often you are working behind the scenes, there are no coincidences. Lord, you bring things together. And Father, we worship and thank you. And we think of the state of the world today. We continue to pray for the world. Bless us that, Lord, in these dark times, that there will be some diamonds, that people will come to Christ in the midst of this dark backdrop. Save people, we pray. And bless us and be with us. We pray in particular, Lord, for Gita's mother, um, Lord, who's having problems with her eyesight. We pray, God, that you would touch her, heal her, reduce the pressure on her eyes. And all the others that we've prayed for already, Lord, continue to uphold them and be with them. And help each one to know, to know you if they don't know you, to turn to you, to know that whatever comes upon them, there's a purpose for it, and that is to turn to Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you'd help us, Lord, to know your providential hand at work and to see your purposes for our lives, to know what you are saying to us. Help us to understand, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.